Hey, everybody, welcome back to Matrix Mash. I'm Emily Moyer from Off Planet Radio, and my buddy Robert Phoenix from 11th House, Astro 11th House Astrology is with me. Robert, hello. Hey, what's happening, Emily? And what's happening out there, internets? Uh, you know, it's a crazy, crazy world, crazy world. We're here for another Matrix Mash. It's been a few weeks, but uh, we're here to mash it up tonight. We're going to talk Isaac Cappy, John Cena, Quentin Tarantino, Jordan Peterson, and past lives. Robert Phoenix, here we go. Yeah, hey, before we jump into that, you were watching Serena Williams today in the French <laughs> Open, and I and you asked me to watch it. I couldn't watch it at the time, but um, but what was going on with Serena Williams today? I like I just was watching a little bit at work, and I was like, okay, so I you know she she lost the uh, first set, but you know she you know came back after that. Or was it the first set? Of, yeah, she lost the first set, and then she came back and she won her match. It's the first round of the French Open, but you know. I, I was looking at it from afar, and I'm like, oh, she's back to wearing, a, you know, kind of a normal tennis outfit. The last few uh, Grand Slams, we've been treated to these very bizarre, like, space-looking outfits that seem designed to really, like, hyper-accentuate how odd her body is and whatnot. But then when I got closer, I realized it wasn't really a skirt. It looked like some kind of toga or diaper, and it was zebra-striped. <laughs> it's just like, wow. the madness continues. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I don't know if this is supposed to like be like a signal that, you know, like the Roman Empire is back or, you know, and so they have, uh, you know, Serena, you know, they're a goddess wearing a toga and, you know, women are now men or whatever. So I don't know. I don't know. But it was an interesting outfit. Uh, I did find it less offensive than some of the prior ones. I didn't find myself feeling, you know, assaulted by looking at it, but I, it was awfully weird. Yeah. Well, that's been kind of her trademark, right? Uh, she, I mean, she had a weird period of time, like in the late '90s, where she was into wearing all these like weird, like almost like Tina Turner or Mad Max looking outfits on the tennis court back when she was sponsored by Puma or designing some of her own stuff. And then, you know, she always has her own stuff. None of the other players, she's sponsored by Nike. None of the other players will have the same outfit as her. Like you see, like most of the other players that are sponsored by Nike, like will have. Some, uh, you know, several of the players will be wearing stuff from the same line. But yeah. when you have, like, uh, for Serena, Roger, and Rafa, basically, nobody else wears the thing that they're wearing. Like, they all have their own, their own lines. I think Maria Sharapova has her own line as well. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so for a while, it was just she had different stuff than everyone else. But it was fairly standard-looking tennis stuff, maybe a little, you know, a little weird. She likes fashion and whatever. But since she's come back from having the baby or having the baby or whatever, right? Like right. it's just been the theater of the absurd. It's been bizarre. I mean, really bizarre. So do you have me on screen share? Can I, can I share images? Oh, let me make you able to share images. Here we go. Make you co-host. Bingo. Go ahead. Beautiful. All right. So let's give people a visual here. <laughs> we're talking about because I found the image. This, mm -hmm. so, th so this is... So we're talking about, right? This is what she was so wearing today. That's the outfit, but if you can get it, yeah. So like, it's like I, I didn't see her with the tank top on. By the time I tuned into the mat, she had a longer sleeve shirt on. I think it was cold. Mm -hmm. If you can find another angle, you'll see that like the shorts like are sort of tucked in in a weird way, almost like you know, like a diaper or a toga or something. Yeah, that's how it looked from the angle I was watching it from. So apparently, apparently, um, and I got another image which I'll show you. Okay. And this is something she's cooked up with Nike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of her stuff is, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to show you this image. And so this is what we're talking about. This is the promote. So she created this be before and obviously, and Nike is using this as marketing. It's called the X Cape. The X Cape. That's really X -Cape, interesting. Right. And now we're, we're about huh. ready to see a new X-Men movie. Mm-hmm. Coming out, right, which is the Dark Phoenix. This is the rise of the Dark Phoenix. Ah. Okay, so we have... Oh, we I have, did see that billboard for that with the girl with the X in her eye, the fire thing, and yeah. Right, so this is called the X-Cape or the X-Cape. So, so uh, Nike sponsored this. And, it, and And it's hitting right at the same time the new X-Men movie with the rise of the Dark Phoenix. Is. And did you see Madonna's performance last week at some, at some Eurovision something? Oh, the rather? Eurovision thing. And she right. had the X over her eyes. She was doing Like a Prayer, and she was performing with some rapper and whatever, and she had an X on her eye. Yeah. Yeah, that, that Eurovision performance, uh, 
got roundly sort of. Um, it was so weird. Cold. It was yeah. So did you see the whole thing? Uh, I, I just watched the Madonna thing. Uh, Elisa Elisa E sent it to me. Okay, so one of the things. Let me see if I can find a, an image of that, so we can. Some people haven't actually seen that. Let's just take take a look. So one of the things that um, Madonna Eurovision, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, you're she looked like some sort of demented raggedy ann pirate doll with the it was, it was so weird yeah and it was like a beltane ritual and a satan or something you know going on with the like a prayer i mean like a prayer is an amazing song it's one of her best songs and this was very weird i mean it was obviously a ritual you know it was very strange um let's show people what the hell we're talking about here it is very strange so here's, here's the getup. Let me make the uh, image a little bit bigger. And we can uh, give people, you know, important visual here. There she is. Right. I mean, just take a look at this. She's got the X over one eye. The X on her chest. She's got some sort of like snake eating its tail or some kind of animal something on the bottom. You know, she's got a crown on. Right, and she's wearing, she's wearing the dark robes. The dark robes. She had all the red lights in the background. She's got the red lipstick on. You know, she was doing all this weird stuff that the closest thing I could say that it looked to look like when you watch the Beltane ritual from the, you know, what's it called, the Vatican? Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, apparently, one of the kind of... And then it was like apocalyptic videos going, yeah. Right. So, so here's another image from there. Um... It's kind of an interesting one. So let's 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 bring this up. It's a, kind of a different image where she is. It looks like what we've seen here in, as part of the. I uh, guess towards the end of the song, might even be the ending of the song. So we've got people in gas masks. Yep. That are laid yeah. laid out right, and they have garlands of flowers in their hair. Yep. Yeah, and I think these people are representative of different countries. This is a Central American country, is it not? Yeah. That coast. And they were all in white gowns, yeah. Yeah. So this Combat is Combat boots on. Yeah, this is some kind of Denver airport. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're alive. This is yeah. what it is. Yeah, that right? I, I didn't think about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, it's it's predictive programming, you, you know, one oh one, really. Um, and they can't not like let go of any kind of public performance now without it becoming some camp satanic ritual. Right. I, I mean, even if I were interested in Satanism, this wouldn't interest me after a no. while. No. I'd, be tur I'd be turned off by it. Yeah. Like if I was a real Satanist, I'd be offended by this shit. Well, this is like, uh, like, um, like kitty, kitty Satanism. Right. This is like he Hello Kitty, like Satanism at the Hello Kitty yeah. shop. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like this, you know, Sanrio does Satanism. I'd, I'd be I'd be a pissed Satanist if I saw this. <laughs> right. And if I was a Satanist, which I'm not. Right. But but it's like so camp, so over the top, and yeah. it, and it's kind of done for public consumption, it, you know. And a lot of it seems to be kind of like, you know, really camp, kind of in your face, like adolescent, post adolescent gay outrage. That's what it yeah. feels like. To me. Yeah. You know, and it's like, fuck you, Christians, and, you know, fuck you, all, all you normal people. This is about as close as we can get to so-called normal people. It's about as close as we can get to doing something really uh, outrageous on stage without crossing lines. And, yeah. And trying to be somewhat highbrow, you know, about the whole thing. It's just, it's, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous, and I think people are getting, ti they're getting tired of it. Well, she's also become such a caricature of herself. Yeah, it's got you know, pretty, pretty it's, embar it's embarrassing. It's sad. It's, it's sad. I really liked her when I was younger. I'm sure on a certain level, you know, it was all being used. I know for sure that it was all being used for a certain level of mind control and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But there was a time when it was like, okay, she's kind of cool. Some of, some of those early songs were cool, you know, back in the early 80s. They were very dancey. They were very fun. It was fun. You know what I mean? And now it's just like, you know, she's an old woman and she is on stage doing who has children and she's on stage doing this stuff you know what i mean it's like you have tons of money dude like either make something beautiful or go away yeah it was, it was really interesting she she broke through to another level with that ray of light record 
Mm-hmm. And that was produced by William Orbit. And I yeah, thought, that was a great record. I thought, wow, Madonna is maturing. She's growing yep. up. This is fantastic. And then she followed it up with some kind of, you know, trashy kind of Euro house thing. It's like, Ugh. you know, she just, yep. she just couldn't get out of the seamy side of the street. Right. Yeah. Well, and then like, it's gotten to, the, it's gotten increasingly ridiculous with each album after that too. Yeah. You know, you know. And now she's, you know, pushing really hard with this new tour and it's just it's just not it's not going to end well for madonna nope I, well they, they, i mean just they're gonna do the same thing with her that they're doing with serena williams right like this person has dominated her scene for so long right and ultimately she's being used to mock the public but she's got she's being mocked at the same time she looks ridiculous she looks ridiculous she absolutely. looks ridiculous absolutely yeah. Um, I mean, so, you can age, you can be a huge star and age gracefully and go out on your own terms like a Tina Turner did or, or something like that. You know what I mean? You don't have to be, you don't have to do it like this. You know? Well, the only thing I could think of is that, you know, there are deals that she's made. Oh, yeah. And she has to follow the, the rules. The rules. Of the yeah. And if, they, and if they tell her to go out in front of people and debase herself, she's going she to yeah. do it. She has yeah. to. Part of the contract. Yep. Part of the contract. Yeah. So it's not going to end well. She doesn't have any artistic control or cre- artistic creativity. And she's kind of, you know, limping along to the finish line. Yeah. And, and she's got no say in how it all ends. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. Agreed. All righty. So now that we've given our Serena Williams and Madonna update, what you got for me? <laughs> yeah. So, um, where do we go? From? So sh- let's let's talk a little bit about Isaac Cappy. Okay, this is a, to be like this is a person in a story that I have. I mean, of course, like I've heard the name and I think I understand a little bit what he's about. But this wasn't a story that I latched on too much. So well, well okay, so it, it, out I me. mean, it was floating out there right for a while, and he kind of made a big he made a big splash or big impact, and, and I'm curious as to like, were you not interested? Did your instincts tell you to stay away from it? What, what, it's what? so funny that you asked this because I was thinking about this today because I knew we were going to talk about this. Yeah. It is a really interesting thing with all of these things, like with all of the conspiratorial stuff, with all the false flags, with all the shootings, with all the all this stuff. Some of them really grab me and some of them don't. And when the ones that don't grab me, it doesn't mean that I don't think they're real or they're not real. You know, I don't think, it's not that I don't think that they're a thing. Like, for example... Sandy Hook didn't really grab me. The Boston bombing did. Um, I, well, I did pay a good amount of attention to 9-11. I think Bo- uh, Oklahoma City is far more interesting. Um, you know, s- s- some of the shootings, you know, like really grabbed my attention and others, I'm just like, eh. I don't know why, but for some reason, this didn't grab me. And I'm fairly suspicious anytime somebody who says they're a, uh, who is a celebrity or is some kind of Hollywood insider or whatever comes out and people, you know, start, you know, I was suspicious of Corey Feldman, suspicious of, you know, any of these people that do this. I don't know why I can't say I have like some specific reason, but intuitively, like I, I, I tend to think that people who are actors are full of shit. Um, I'm from Los Angeles and I was in the business when I was younger and I did not like it. And I, you know, I got out um, and I, they're all around me. And, um, you know, I can say that, for the most part, most of them are full of shit. And so I, you know, and then with some of the stories, they just, there has to be some certain kind of weird element that grabs me in a way that, you know, for any of these kinds of events or stories or whatever, and then I'll be really into it. And other times I'm just like, eh. Yeah. So tell me why this one grabbed you. Well, I mean, before I do, I, the whole Corey Feldman thing, um, if you were following Corey Feldman at all, you, you knew that Corey Feldman was, you know, really suspect in his character and in his nature. It, and if people haven't seen the two Corys, mm-hmm. I think it was on E! I think it was on their network. Mm-hmm. Um, watch the last two, ep- I think there were like four or five episodes. And it was about them coming back together and, and they were doing therapy. Mm-hmm. And it's a really weird premise for a show. And... Corey Haim, who's the other Corey. Who's dead uh, man. Right. And he was, he was really struggling. And he was struggling with, but he was trying to get better. Yeah. Right? He was, str- both of them, 
you know, apparently had been abused and violated. And mm -hmm. Corey Haim really seemed to have the PTSD kind of yep. effects mm -hmm. of that. He, yep. he could not separate himself from his drug addiction. Right. Um, and he was going through it and getting better on this show. In the meantime, he was also having uh, very in, sort of intense confrontational moments with Corey Feldman. And Corey Feldman at that time had gotten married to like this penthouse. Uh, yeah. Who seemed a lot like Corey's handler in a lot of ways. Ah. And uh, so, so they're going through this kind of therapy thing and it's clear that Corey Haim is beginning to go like this. Right. Yeah. And, and, and get off the, get off the train. Yeah. And, um, at one point he'd taken a diazepam or something like that. This is being Corey Haim. Yeah. Uh, and because it was, a you know, prescribed drug to help him deal with his anxiety. So something happened and it wasn't terrible, but it, but it got back to Corey Feldman. Mm -hmm. So Corey Feldman, Todd Bridges and Polly Shore show up at Corey Haim's house for an intervention. Oy vey. And if anybody wants to see gaslighting at work, I highly recommend just watching that mm -hmm. part of that episode. By the time they leave and Corey Feldman leaves, it's pretty clear what side one Corey's on and what side the other Corey's on. Yeah. And, and Corey Feldman is clearly on the handler side. Ah. Uh. And um, it's, it's, it's very depressing to watch. And not long after that, uh, Corey Haim winds up Dead. overdosing, right? Yeah. Dead. Yeah. Well, so, it's always interesting to me. I mean, you know, Todd Bridges was always in a lot of trouble, but he survived. Dana Plato, from, who was also on Different Strokes, she was in a lot of trouble. She did not. You know what I mean? Her, you know, her, it, it, it's, you know, Corey Feldman survived this. Corey Haim did not. Like, what is going on with that? It seemed, that seems to be a common theme that when multiple people from a show struggle, one of them seems to cut, turn out, cut, come out of it, you know, somewhat okay, and one of them not, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you, well, when you go into Corey Feldman's background, it's a lot different than Corey Haynes. Yeah. Corey Feldman's older sister was a member of the second generation of the Mickey Mouse Club. Oh. Yeah, yeah. so... Okay. so, so Everybody knows the first generation with Annette Funicello and Frankie Avalon, right? Right. And then everybody knows sort of the third version with um, Britney Spears Britney and, Spears, and Justin, Aguilera, Timberlake. Justin Timberlake. Yeah. Ryan Gosling is on there too, by the way. Ah. He was so, but there's a sandwich. It's the return of the Mickey Mouse Club, mm -hmm. and Corey Feldman's older sister. Interesting. Uh, is in it, and then Corey Feldman's father is part of one of these weird kind of bubblegum groups that came up out of New York huh. in the 1960s. It was like back, back then there were these songwriters that worked in the, in the Brill building and in and around the Bill building. And they're like, that's where Neil Diamond comes from. That's where Carol King comes from. Um, I think Glenn Campbell spent a little time there anyway. Uh, so his father comes kind of out of that, tradition and uh they 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 wrote like these ridiculous kind of bubblegummy pop songs just mm -hmm. for, for cash and money yeah so his father comes out of that world and and then eventually moves to los angeles and gets involved in the music so his you never hear much about Corey feldman's parents but they they have their hooks into the entertainment business right and I would not be surprised if they had, let's just say, fiduciary relationships with their kids. Yeah. Okay. And that's never, you never hear him talk about his father. Right. You never hear him talk about his mother. You know, all you hear him, you know, Corey Feldman did emancipate himself at around 16 or 17. Mm -hmm. That did happen. He went through the legal process because apparently his parents were jacking with his money. Right. Uh, so anyway, I, there, you know, you just go down to Corey Feldman rabbit hole and it's just not and this not does relate, this does relate to Isaac Cappy by the way because he does he does sort of lash out at Corey Feldman is Isaac Cappy an actor yes okay. absolutely yeah so 
he is a like a C minus actor, like a C minus role, maybe C plus. Okay, so I know he sort of inserted himself into the Pizzagate narrative. Right. So so his acting career, if you could call it that, okay, uh, uh, spanned uh, you know appearances in Thor. He was in Thor. Okay. Um, he was in Breaking Bad. So he had a. Oh, career. that's where I. That's why he looks familiar. He was in Breaking Bad. I used to watch that. Yeah. He so he had a career. It wasn't wasn't great, but he was getting paid and, and he had roles. Now, what he did is he nestled himself into a scene with uh, the comedian, Dane Cook. Yeah, okay. And Seth Green. Okay. Uh, who's an actor and, you know, and uh, he, Seth, and Seth's wife, Claire, became very good friends. They used to have these game nights at Dane Cook's house. Okay. There's like just literally, you know, dozens and dozens of these photos on Instagram. I don't know if they're still there anymore, but they were. Of all of them hanging out, they go to Dane Cook's house, they play all these games, right? Probably drink, get high, whatever. Okay. And, and um, so that was his world. He was very close to Claire and Seth Green. Seth Green made a joke one time about this passage in between his wall in another room. Mm -hmm. And he says, and this is where we, where we keep the children. Mm -hmm. right? So, so Isaac Cappy began to kind of take notes on all this stuff. And then of course he heard certain things about certain people in the business, like Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks and his first Periscope video blew up. Right. I mean, it blew up. People don't have hit records anywhere. They have like first videos. Yeah. And it, and it blew up and he was, you know, riffing on Periscope. And he was talking about Tom Hanks and he was talking about Steven Spielberg and he was talking about Seth Green and Claire. And he was very close to Seth Green and Claire. Like they were friends. And then perhaps it was his conscience. I don't know. You know, some people believe that he was so moved. Um, you know, there's, there's this, like, I don't, he, he definitely went from being in Hollywood to being out of Hollywood. Because once he made that video, he was done. Okay. He was okay. just done. And so is there, is there any question as to whether this was an organic thing or a setup thing? Well, I mean, I look at his chart. I did his chart. And asked for I remember you did his chart, yeah. Asked for logically. There was something going on. I mean, the guy was actually being triggered, right? Mm -hmm. Being triggered. But, you know, one of the things that, that I think we, you and I have talked about before is that when we talk about something, sometimes it can be more than one thing. Right. Right. So I think he was kind of being moved on some level by what was happening internally and astrologically. And, and the uh, reverse of that was that he probably kind of hit a bit of a cul-de-sac in his career. Yeah. That's so the two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. Okay. Right. Yeah. So he puts out this periscope and then, you know, he's, he's uh, like making all these rounds on all these different programs and shows and Nathan. Right. He was on with a, uh... Nathan Stoltman and all that stuff, right? Right. And then Fiona Barnett took him under her wing, and she right. became very fond of him. Okay. They became almost inseparable, right? Huh. Now, uh, now I, first of all, I don't think it's all that great of a revelation. No. Perhaps Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg, you know, might be pedophiles. No. I don't think, and anybody's been kind of, you know, circling that drain for a while. Well, right. this is, here's the deal pretty for the, I mean, no, I don't want to say everybody cause there's a lot of people in Hollywood and some of them are just, you know, people with dreams and actors and who are just jobs and they're just making a hundred thousand dollars a year and they're not, you know, whatever. But anybody who is big time either is one or knows about knows which people are and they're not saying anything. And right. at this point right. that makes them culpable of something. Now, again, I'm going to, I've, I've shared this story before. And um, it is, it, it comes from an actor that I once knew in Hollywood and uh, he, he had some, he had some roles. If I told you the show he was on, you probably might even recognize him, right? Mm -hmm. And he told me that, and he'd been around Hollywood all of his life. His father was a script writer, okay? okay? So it wasn't like he just came in on a bus from out of town. He knew the game right. inside and out. And he told me that if you wanted to have like a serious agent in Hollywood, an agent that, you know, casting director picks up the phone and there are five people 
at the top of that call list that they're going to call, yeah. right? You want one of those five guys mm -hmm. that you had to pay a price for that. Yep. Didn't matter if you were a male or a female, right? They had to, they had, so essentially, you know, they had to break solemn and seal. Yeah. So you had to take it in the bum. Yeah. It didn't matter who you are. If you wanted to get to that level, right? Yeah. So just do the math on that. Just do the math on that. Like anybody who's anybody had to cross that line. Right. And um, so where do you go from there? What happens after that? What happens psychologically? What happens spiritually once that line is crossed? You know, there are people. Well, also, and, and certainly what, once that line is crossed under those circumstances, right? Like, you know, like, you know, for that purpose, like, you know what I mean? Like, well, it's a yeah. power move. It's a power move, right? Yeah. I mean, basically the manager's saying, I own you, body, mind, and spirit. And it's a completely different thing than, than you know, whatever. If you're in a long-term intimate relationship with somebody and that's, you know, whatever. That's a totally right. if you're, different thing. If you're consenting adults, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. But when, you, when, when a deal is being made around that. Right. Right. Like that is, is you know, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's so, right. So it's a, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good, um, it's it's a it's a good fine fine point to bring up. Yeah, but you're right. It's the deal aspect. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. So just just keep just keep that in mind. Yeah. So so Isaac Cappy began to talk about <clears throat> Tom Hanks and and Steven Spielberg, and um, so I'm like, okay, well, you know, I did his chart. I got into it. I'm like, man, this guy's this guy's playing with fire. I mean, I saw it in his chart. He was playing with fire. He had Mars transiting his ascendant and going retrograde into his 12th house. And I just like, man, just you better be careful. And um, lo and behold, whatever happened, happened. But along the way, you know, I continued to watch some of his videos on Periscope. And I, and I thought they were, for you know, lack of a better term, I thought they were embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Really embarrassing because it seemed like he was skimming around, trying to find talking points you know, for trying to find sort of the same kinds of research that people like me, you and Randy do on the internet and right. grabbing something, and, you know, and then talking to his Paris, Periscope group, which, you know, happened very, very quickly. And I was watching people in their, in their um, comments, like, this is ridiculous. I'm out of here. So what we had is we had somebody who maybe spontaneously awakened or maybe was in on, I don't know. And thinks every thought and revel every thought and revelation he has is newsworthy and worth making a video that people will follow. Right. And then, yeah. But then shortly thereafter, he was also friends with Paris Jackson. Okay. And he assaulted Paris Jackson. Okay. During this time. Okay. So, so she had to get a restraining order. That doesn't seem very smart. <laughs> well, it seems imbalanced, right? I mean, yeah. You know, here you've just kind of, you know, hit a version of the third rail, and now you're attacking uh, the sis the daughter of, you know, one of America's theoretical great icons. Of course, before the film came out, simultaneous. But but I mean, his great great icon. Some people say he's a pedophile. He's not here to defend him. It's all this kind of right, like it is a weird like that. That was the person he got into that situation with. Is bizarre. Right, exactly. Unless it's so, not. Unless it's not. So, so, <clears throat> you know, Ray, I haven't seen the video yet, but Randy and Thomas Williams just did a big thing, yeah, about about like the truth community and right and and I thought you know like if you go back and you look at the videos of Anthony Sutton, which you can find right on YouTube, they are profound. They are deeply researched. This was a guy who was a fellow at the Hoover Institute at right. Stanford. And he went in and he dissected skull and bones. He dissected the relationship between the United States and Russia. And that, that bed was sort of the foundation. He came up with the Hegelian dialectic. Right. We'll talk about that. We're referencing Anthony Sutton. And then look at where we are now. Mm-hmm. And we're and I don't know if this is really I haven't seen Randy and Thomas's video, but I'm wondering if this you know if this is the tone and the tenor of it. I think it might be. And Isaac Cappy kind of fits in that that mold. He was somebody who, you know, had a matchstick, was incandescent, and had no preparation. Right? He stumbled on it's like he stumbled onto something 
you know, maybe it was this thing with Seth Green. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of went off and, and he became kind of unmoored in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. and, so you're and, saying that like, okay, so you're saying that the Randy and Thomas were talking about these kinds of people that show up in the community. Yeah. Do this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So Isaac Cappy is like another version of a Corey Good or whatever. Well, yeah. And, I, and again, I, I looked at his chart. Something was happening there with right. him. Well, I think, I, was, with all, I think with all of these people, that show up and capture attention, whether it's deserved attention or not deserved attention, it, it only takes hold because there is something going on with them, right? right? There's something energetically that is, whether there's actually a conspiracy behind it or whether just energetically things are, you know, things are conspiring to bring about this moment where this person captures people's attention and is able to, you know, generate some sort of bullshit or whatever right like or, or or not or generate something that is actually profound right generally something is happening you know with these people i don't think it's just i don't think any of it's by accident no it's not by accident and in a lot of ways um the system has been kind of rigged in that regard and yeah. the reason the reason why it's been rigged in that regard is because there's no resolution yeah no resolution you can have sort of the you know the the you know the the the, the burning moments right you could have the 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 olive bush moment right you know what were the burning bush moment you could have that and anybody who's had an awakening experience has had that moment yeah we've all had that moment at some point in time in our lives you, you put the sunglasses on it's like you know you can see the signs right? yeah and what you do with that moment from that moment forward mm -hmm. is very, very important. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a little bit older than you, um, but, you know, my real kind of wake up call happened. It was progressive, I would say. Um, but my real wake up call happened in 1989, 1990, when mm -hmm. we went, went to war with Iraq. Mm hmm. And prior to that, I spent the first war, the first war, the first one prior yeah. to that, I spent between roughly 83 and 90, like delving into myself and looking mm -hmm. at my shadow and throwing a fin horn and, you know, trying to understand kind of the, the spiritual, you know, um, litmus, the spiritual DNA inside of me. All right. And, and so when I went through that wake up moment, I had that whole pre, and I'm not saying I'm anything special, but I went down a path of like rigorous self-examination. Mm -hmm. And, and then when I hit that wake up moment, that rigorous self-examination and a lot of the kind of metaphysical experiences that I had kind of joined that. Yeah. So moving forward, I kind of had something to, you know, ground me with. And then you watch Isaac Cappy's last video he basically calls himself a Judas and mm. then he, and then he realizes, or this is what he tells people that he didn't have, he really was looking in the wrong place and the wrong place was out there and not in there with him. Now this gets back to a really important thing that I think Randy and maybe Thomas were hitting. I don't know. I haven't seen the video, but in, in the movie network, which is a famous movie, there's a character played by Peter Finch. His name is Howard Beale, and he gets up, he, he suffers a breakdown as part of this newscast, and he says, says I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm familiar with that famous line, yes. Okay, so what happens is that he starts to, he has the burning bush moment, and then he has everybody, they, they are with him, right? People are with him, and then what happens is he has a sit down with Ned Beatty, who's the head of this corporation. And Ned Beatty basically tells him, you're, you're messing with the powers of God. Mm -hmm. And then Howard Beale comes back and basically says to everybody that, you know, well, I wasn't wrong, but it wasn't really right either. And then he you know, basically chimes in and, and, and puts a, just a wet blanket on everything. Mm -hmm. And, and I think Patty Shayevsky knew that people would wake up, that there would be people inside of, if not the media, certainly the alternative media who'd have these moments. And at some point, right, whether it's Isaac Cappy telling people that he had betrayed them, 
because he betrayed the cause or whatever, or was Alex Jones going through the things that you and I have talked about, that at some point this whole thing would sort of invert and turn on itself. Yeah. And, and, I, well, and, and I think that's kind of where we are. That's what he's symbolic of. Absolutely. I mean, what we see here as the mainstream media, you know, becomes exposed and becomes, you know, people are starting to realize and not watch it, rather than it folding, what instead has happened is that YouTube has turned into the promotional arm of the mainstream media. At the same time, people stopped believing the media, the thing that was supposedly the, um, you know, <clears throat> the platform for independent media or ind individual creators suddenly, you know, became the promoter of the mainstream media. So now instead of watching it on the TV, it's being recommended to you in your YouTube feed. I mean, when I go and watch one of your videos now, Robert, there's no below it, it doesn't recommend other videos you've done. It's got, you know, the most, like there's a few kind of alternative-ish things, like they might recommend a TED talk you know what I mean? Or a Joe Rogan show or something like that. But also shit that's in there is like regular mainstream media stuff or Vice. Fox or News. Fox News. Fox News or see it, whatever. So yeah, they, it yeah. is now like, okay, we couldn't, we couldn't, um, you know, we, we got exposed here. So now we're going to infiltrate the thing, like the, the independent media and, and, and saturate them with our bullshit. And so they, you know, like it, 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 that's what, it's the wet blanket, right? It's the wet blanket effect. It's the same kind of thing. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and compared to Twitter, YouTube is a, a, a veritable, you know, freelandia. Yeah. I mean, Twitter is Twitter is even worse. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I had maybe two. I've got a I've got a fifteen minutes of flame Twitter feed. I think I put up one or two shows, maybe. Yeah, maybe. you texted me and said they took your video down or they, they deleted you. They, they, no, they suspended my channel. Why? Somebody complained about my one video. One video. <laughs> All it takes now is to and have- And you probably have what? A hundred followers on, on, on that Twitter, on the 15 Minutes of Flame Twitter? If that's, I have, <laughs> you know, it's, it was totally ridiculous. It is silly. I mean, what's really interesting about the whole thing too is like, so you know how you, we got, uh, um, we didn't get a strike, but we got like this, weird thing when you and I did that big expose on Joe Rogan, right? We got this weird thing noticed saying that like, we got a claim, right? And so they would either get, get the money from monetization of our video, which we don't monetize on Off Planet Media, so there's not that, or they were able to look at the, um, the data about our video, like they could see how many people watched it, how many people liked it, the comments and stuff, like that, whatever, right? They could have access to the back end of it. And what's, so, you know, so I thought that was interesting. Um, but I heard just Joe Rogan the other day talking on his show about like they won't play. So even though I don't, I don't know how much of this is coming from Joe Rogan or from people who control Joe Rogan, but he was like, we can't even play other people's YouTube videos because we'll get a copyright claim, right? Like, you know what I mean? So it's happening to him, but he's doing it to other people. You know what I mean? So it's in Here, the Here's what I think. Here's what I think. Yeah. I, I think because I had a copyright claim come from a, uh, Russell Brand a couple of weeks ago. Mm. And I don't think Russell Brand was watching my show. No. I don't even think Russell Brand's people were watching my show. Okay. Because mm -mm. no. it, ha it happened literally within an hour of my show. Right. And I think what YouTube has done is they've created a bot and an algorithm that goes through and automatically every video gets uploaded and it gets scanned. Mm -hmm. for any external imagery and as soon as they get that little blippy thing they go and they look at it and they will immediately look at whether or not the person who has the the, who, the, the person whose video you've used if they have copyright infringement um kind of um, uh, uh opt-ins right? right so if they have the opt-in then and Joe Rogan does because he, he does make copyright claims on people who steal his comedy clips. And that, I think that's okay. Right. So, yeah. so, so really, I think it's more of an automated process. Yeah. But it's annoying. <laughs> well, of course it's annoying because now AI is unilaterally making decisions. Yeah. It's been taken out of, unless, of course, the final arbiter is a human. Right. And, and to be honest with you, I, you know, I... I didn't use more than maybe two minutes of that clip. Yeah. 
you know, but, but, you know, now and it's that, like, yeah, the fair use doesn't seem to be in effect anymore. No, it's not, it's not. And I even linked to the video and, um, and I, and I wasn't even really like, you know, being a smart ass or bad mouthing or, you know, critically breaking it down a little bit, but it wasn't like I was, he, it wasn't like I was out to get Russell Brand or. No, or we've Brand. talked about Russell. We, he, he, there's lots to like about Russell Brand, and there's some stuff to not like about Russell Brand. That's how it is with all these characters. Anyway, I think it's automated now, and that, yeah. in some ways, is even more frightening. Yep. Right, because because it just it's kind of like you know when you go to customer service. And you try to change something. The person says, I'm sorry, I, I can't do well, anything. Well, that's the whole thing with YouTube. There's no one to contact. You can't contact anybody if you have a, if you have a problem. Well, There's no, no... well, you can contact somebody if you have a complaint against the video. They make that abundantly clear, trust me. Right, but you can't, there's no, like, and, and even with Patreon, it's like there's no customer help desk where there's a person you can talk to. Everything is done through, you know, sort of emails to nebulous departments or through, you know, automated, you know, kind of crap. And yeah, and, and it's not because, it's because they don't want to have to be responsible for anything. And so if they make it so that there's no one you can talk to, that it can just be this endless circle of bullshit. Right, you're, 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 you're in this kind of Kafka-esque universe, right? Yeah. Where you're just going in circles and want to pull your hair out. Um, and it also saves them money. So it's a win-win for them. Yeah. You know, you get, you get sucked into the vortex of their system and they get to, you know, save on customer service people. Yeah. Okay. So what happened with Isaac Cappy? He did this last video. So I, I heard that like he said he'd turn to the dark side or something like that. Like, what was that about? Yeah. So Cappy, um, it's, it's Cappy, not cat. It's Cappy, not cat. <laughs> so, so he has Hi, Jasper. Not, he has his last video that he does at the at this place called the Larpers Lounge, mm -hmm. and basically he says that he fucked up and um, and he's doing it live. It's a Periscope live, and um, so he's he's basically telling people that he was a Judas, which is really interesting because this gets into some of that Julian. He means stuff. that in what sense? Well, he uh, so there there was a big thing on Reddit where he was. Um, doxing and outing patriots or there it was like there were people that somehow were getting heat from a third party and that they had traced it back to isaac cappy or something okay so that was kind of going on and i don't know what else he was referring to but he was basically saying that he did something very bad and that he sold his soul and he asked for people to pray for him. And, um, you know, it was really dark. And people were asking, well, did it involve kids? He said, no, but it involved money. And one of the things that he was into was gambling. Mm -hmm. He was a gambler. He all these people always have something like that going on. Yep. He, he might have had some kind of bed he plays because obviously he wasn't acting anymore. Oh, hi, Jasper. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi, baby. <laughs> So he wasn't acting anymore. So he had to make some money. So I think somebody, you know, probably said, here, place this bet and he lost a bet. And who knows? I don't, I don't know. I'm just spending. Yeah. Okay. But he, so he, but there was more to it than just that. Like he did something, you know, quote unquote terrible. And he called himself a Judas. Right. Mm -hmm. And if, Which I just looked up and it means he was a peephole in a door. So he was a way to, he was a way for, one group to get to another group or to see what was going on with the community. Right. He, he was using Periscope as the telescope that somebody else could look, you know, right. Somebody else could look through and he, yeah. they would see who he made videos. They saw who glommed on to them, who had him on their show, which community they could next invade or, or whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, so, he, so he, but the Judas role is what he ascribed himself to. And what's interesting is that in the light of his whole, Julian Assange thing in which, you know, I've been saying that Assange is like this cyber Christ, right? Right. The crucifixion of the cyber. Now we have a Judas character, even though they're not entirely. Interesting. Dead. Interesting. Yeah. Well, well, they're both awfully strange looking too. Isaac Cappy is a little odd. They're, neither of them are, look like normal humans. Isaac Cappy reminds me a little of Charlie Manson. He's got a little of that Manson-esque vibe. About that him. little of that wild eyes. Yeah. Little so bit. Isaac Cappy killed himself. 
Well, supposedly he, he tossed himself off of a bridge mm -hmm. in Arizona on Route 66, if that's not symbolic enough. Right. Now, now passers-by um, try to apparently keep him from doing that. Now, did, now th this is where it gets into really strange territory. Did he kill himself? Was he killed? Is he dead at all? We don't know. Right. Yeah. You know, because... I don't and he just that. needed an exit. He needed an exit stage left because he'd made such a fool of himself, and now he's just going to dis. He or he, or he was or he was a limited hang. He right. was a limit. Either way, he was a limited hang. Whether it was right. intentional on his part or whether somebody ended up using him as a limited hang, he's a limited hang. Right. And so was Julian Assange. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um. And ultimately, so was Corey Good, right? Which was sort of what the. Uh, Randy and Thomas were talking about, and all of these people, like, they'll either have their character assassinated or they will be assassinated, you know what I mean? One or the other, or they will, have, or they will fake their death or something like that, but they will be disappeared, but you know what I mean? And you will never uh, get to the, the lies they told will never be sorted out, and you'll never find out what really happened to them. That's right, that's right, mm -hmm. yeah. There's no, there's no resolution, which is what you basically said when we started talking about this. Right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's, how they, that's how everything is left these days. There is no but, resolution. People, do, you know, even people we like and trust, weird things happen with, you know, we like or we think we trust it or whatever. You know, like I'm still, and there's probably people that will hold this against me. I'm still waiting for the explanation from Ben Swan as to what happened when he was gone for a year, right? He, just, he came back and he was like, I'm back and he's doing all this stuff. And for the most part, his work is amazing. He researches things well. He presents it very cleanly. But he disappeared and told people to trust him and then when he came back he said he was going to make a video explaining it all and he never did right and right. so there's no resolution there and so like when these things happen with people and we never get any answers as to what happened or why like it's hard for you know what i mean like that seems to be the way that they could information is controlled these days is by just never having a resolution when you know something happens never mm -hmm. there's never a resolution no you know what i mean the person who does it is always either dead or doesn't get caught you know what I mean? Right. And you can even see this like in the rap world with like Nipsey, Russ, Nipsey Hussle. Right. But there are people who think that Nipsey Hussle faked his death. Right. Well, I say about like, just like Tupac and all that kind of stuff. Right. And, and who is the other guy? Triple Extension, that guy? It's Triple another seven, guy yeah. who theoretically, you know, might have faked his own death. I mean, so, you know, we're living in this time where, you know, reality becomes very, very flimsy. And, you know, we've got all these kinds of, you know, multiple parallel running narratives and some of which- Well, this kind of goes into what we're going to get into a little later right. with some of this discussion of past lives and reincarnation and stuff like that as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So before we kind of wind over to that, I think you also wanted to talk about John you, Cena? Yeah, or I, yeah, I do. I do. But I think ultimately what this really gets down to is that there's, there's no closure. There's, there's just never, no, yeah. cl there's no closure. And- Closure is really important, whether it's a relationship or, mm -hmm. you know, there's just, there's, we're not getting the, the type of closure that, that we need. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's, so I, I ultimately, I like, if you're watching this and, you, and people watch us and you're they're looking for inside, they're trying to glean something that they can kind of hang their hat on. Um, and I, and I think ultimately it's, you know, we cannot necessarily trust that world. We can comment on it. Yep. We can shine a light on it. Yep. At the end of the day, you're going to have to figure out like how you're going to make your life meaningful. Yep. In, and it in, can't, it can't depend on answers that about from somebody else. No, no, it can't. And you may stumble on something and it may be yeah. really interesting. Right. And that's yeah, but that can't it's be fun. how you decide if your life is important or not. Right. Right. Like these people who like need answers before they're going to be able to continue on in their own life or take care of themselves or whatever. Like, it just doesn't work that way. It's like you need to find the answers to a satisfying life for yourself. And then it seems like some of the answers may come. Right. But like there's a lot of people who like, you know, we need disclosure or we need 9-11 truth or anything like that before we can heal anything. It's like, that's not how it works. Uh, well, I, I think the reason why there's such a, an intense urgency around that is because you know we have not had like a meaningful truthful collective bowel movement <laughs> you know, everybody the whole thing is just so backed up and impacted right, right? 
By the way, I saw this woman who was on, you ever watch Naked and Afraid? You watch no. that show? It's actually kind of an interesting show. This woman did not go to, she did not take a poop for 21 days. Oh. Can you believe that? 21 days. <laughs> She has some stories to tell about. Sometimes it. when I travel internationally, it takes a few days before I can poop, and that's unpleasant. So I can't imagine uh, 21 days with no pooping. Right. I think, I think she destroyed a few bathrooms at airports on the way back. <laughs> right. It always happens. It finally happens in the airplane or in the, the bathroom, you know, the airport bathroom. <laughs> right. Well, you're, you're, you're an old gymnast, so you can handle those airplane bathrooms. Really <laughs> most people. I'm 6'3", and those, right. you go to the bathroom, and those, I try to avoid them at all right. costs. Um, but. Well, it always happens. There's like, I can be on a flight where there's never any turbulence. The turbulence will only happen, you know what I mean? Right when you're like squatting over the toilet, right? And so you're trying to not touch it, but it starts to, you know what I mean? That, that's <laughs> never happened to me. That's, a, that's an Emily special right there. <laughs> Right. All right. So I think our I think our stream has gone into the shitter. So maybe <laughs> change change gears here. All but, right. All right. So, so next yeah. topic. Okay. So I watch. I I have to say I'm either watching sports or the Discovery Channel, a little bit of the Food Network, mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, the uh, you know, the. The House Network, whatever that one's called. Yeah, I, the HGTV. HGTV. Food I never network. watch anymore, but I was obsessed with HGTV for a good bit, dude. I was watching HGTV today, and it was like they have a whole show based on buying homes in the Caribbean. Right. Yeah. And um, island life and stuff. I kind of, I kind of binge watch that today. I love that. I love binge watching it. And Discovery Channel. I used to. My favorite thing to binge watch ever was like, like De Deadliest Catch. On Discovery? Oh, we've, talk, we've talked about it. I love that, yeah. <laughs> so, so I started to binge watch Naked and Afraid a few days ago. Right? Yeah. So one of the things that I pay attention to, obviously, is advertising. Oh, by the way, I want to talk a little bit about Discovery Channel before I jump into this thing. All right. Discovery Channel is the, is the whitest channel on, on basically paid cable TV. <laughs> It is the widest channel there is, right? Mm -hmm. The majority of the people on Discovery Channel are white, right? And You're it's probably mostly, right. And mostly, mostly for men. Mostly men. Mostly men, right? But I've noticed now, this has been going on for a while, that the way that they, <laughs> it's like the Discovery Channel glorifies kind of white trash hillbilly culture. Yeah. Right, it's so so. Or, it's, blue, or blue collar culture, white trash. Well, blue collar, but but they also have the crazy white people. Sure. You know, like like uh, homeschooled in Alaska or something. Like yeah. That. <laughs> right. So they've got that stuff. Now they've got to do one about some guy who's. You know, they're 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 basically going after predators or poachers or whatever down in the Everglades. And yeah. You know, more more wild, crazy white people, and you know. Right. In, in rural environments. I'm like, what kind of programming is going on here? This is yep. kind of an interesting level of programming. Anyway, um, so I, I watch a lot of their, um, their adverts. And one of the people that shows up, whether it's on uh, FX, FS1, which is the sports channel with, with Fox, or yeah. Discovery Channel, or I've even seen him on uh, the, I think it was on the, maybe on the Food Network, Anyway, it's John Cena. Okay. And, and let me throw you up a... He shows up in the advertisements or he's guest stars on these shows? No, no, no. He's got a hardcore adver advertising campaign going on. Can so, you show me who he is? Because I'm not sure who so that is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share. So this was, this was John Cena's image oh. as a wrestler. Oh, he looks like a gay porn star. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so this is his image as a wrestler. And he became associated with being, you know, in wrestling, you're a heel or you're a hero. Okay. And, and Cena was- What's a heel? A heel's a bad guy. Oh, okay. Yeah, heel, heel or a hero. Cena was never a heel, you know, as far as my knowledge goes. I'm not, I'm not the expert on wrestling. But for, from what I can remember, he always played the role of the hero, right? So you know, this is casting. They're casting John Cena as this all-American guy. And what are these kind of advertisements is he in? Anything but that. 
Okay, Anything. but like the ad, but either, are there advertisements for shoes or electronics or what is it? Okay, so so he's got he's a spokesperson person for Sky Vodka. Okay. So I'm going to show you one That's of big, his, the Sky Vodka is a big hit in the gay bars for sure. So I'm going to show you one of his Sky Vodka. Right, like in those kinds of gay bars that have like you know two for one drink specials and stuff like that. It's usually on like the Sky Vodka or something like that. Right. So here's mm -hmm. Cena. And it's always about being proud to be an American. Okay. All right. So here he is. Oh, my proudly, God. He looks ridiculous. Right. Proudly American. And, of course, right. he's got the Sky Vodka. Number one. What is he wearing? He's wearing a tutu. He's wearing a tutu with uh, these yoga tights, right? Oy vey. Yeah. So he's, Why? Being, he's being outrageous. Is this a gay pride parade? Or is this a marathon? San Francisco annual charity, charity fun, fun run. run. Okay. So because that's, that's how I want to run a race is in my tutu and yoga tights. I don't even want to do that and I'm a girl. If you, if you go to San Francisco, you could do that. You just have to dodge the dog, the human shit in the, uh, in the streets now. You just have to dodge the human feces. You can right. do that in San Francisco. Uh, so, so this is part of his- But I like to run and I never, like when I, when I run, I want to run in like whatever is like the simplest, most comfortable thing. I, 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 it would never cross my mind to run in a tutu or a costume. This is, this, is, this is straight out of the Beta Breakers. What's that? The Beta Breakers is a race that starts at the bay and runs all the way to the ocean through San Francisco. And, yeah. And every year it's become- more and more outrageous people run as centipedes and you know it's become a vault yeah and so <laughs> so this is kind of a takeoff on like the beta breakers gotcha okay so he so they set him up as being this all-american guy right this all-america tom of finland guy and um so so that's one still here's another still from the same commercial and he's talking about how it's important to be, well, everybody's got something a little bit different that they offer uh, America. This is part of, his, part of his thing on Sky Vodka. So this is, um, I guess. It, it, That's him? No, no, no. But this is oh. a person who's a spokesperson for Sky Vodka, Trixie Maxwell. Is that even a person? Like, what is that? It's a, trans, it's a transvestite. But it doesn't even look like a transvestite. It looks like a blow-up doll. Yeah, I know. But I think, I think it's part of, the, part of the thing, right? Okay. So, so, so this person is in the John Cena commercial. Okay. So he's, so they're, Sky Vodka is, you know, obviously promoting a very wide cross-section Okay. Demographic. But right. seen, seen is the guy that's selling it, and he's the theoretical bridge for being all American. Okay. Right? All American and hey, So it's like it's an all American thing to do to run around a race in a tutu. Gotcha. Right. But this also dovetails with these public service announcements that he does. And in the public service announcements, let me see if I can What okay I didn't let me see if I can find it's it's the same theme, but without the vodka. Um, and the public service for what? For you know, joining being, the military or what? Uh, being an American, and here let me, I have I have one here. It's like um, let me see if I can find another one. Hold on, I got to get a good image here. Um, I think this might be it. Yeah. Okay. So this is, so it's, he's proud to be an American and he's talking about all these different stripes of being an American. So you can see here in the background, he's walking right. towards the camera, talking about how he's proud to be an American and blah, 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 blah. So, so this is basically, it seems like there's like starting out like a promotional lead up to maybe him coming out and being uh the first openly gay wrestler, or are there other openly gay wrestlers? He, he just, well, I don't know if they're openly gay, but um, anyway, he just broke up with his longtime girlfriend. Okay. Whatever that means. But, but so here we have, you see the, the, you have the gay pride fly, flag in the background. Right. Uh, in the short version, there's another scene where there's a Muslim woman in a burqa behind him. There, okay. are, two, there are two women, black and white, who are disabled. They're signing. 
you know, none of this stuff is really terrible. Like, it's like, it's not, you know, it's not like they're consuming babies before our very eyes or anything, but there's, but there's, there's a methodology here. And the methodology. Well, it's like all those Nike commercials, right? Yeah. But it's weird. Like, it's almost like they've heard people commenting on the fact that, oh, there's like, oh, no straight white men in any of these videos. So now they've put like the token, you know, all American type. They're like, okay, you want that? We're going to give you that. But we're, it's almost mockingly. Right. So here we have, there are two commercials that he's done, two public service announcements. One, I think, is about a minute 30. The other's a long one. And here in this scene, you can see a woman soldier in the background. Right. And then you have these two guys with this uh, rainbow parasol behind them. So what he's doing is he's they're, they're mixing and matching with Cena. And he, I, I think he's being, he's being used. He, I think he knows he's being used so that he can somehow be this kind of macho bridge to this decidedly unmacho world, right? Or this typically kind of, masculine or male bridge to this other kind of alternative universe that is based on identity politics. Mm -hmm. And and so he like 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 um participating in identity politics is ultimately the American thing to do. Right. I mean what he's trying to do is he's trying to get middle America an armchair guy sitting at home drinking a beer watching you know some hot rod show on the discovery channel to somehow through the entrainment and the entrancement of television get th get them to accept this on some level mm. that's that's his role now whether or not you think it's a good role or not that's mm -hmm. you i'm just telling you that's his role well and it is we it is weird that he's i've never heard of him before was yeah. he a famous athlete before wrestling oh no but he was a famous wrestler I mean, after The Rock, there was kind of John Cena, right? But was he like a, a real wrestler before he became a professional wrestler? No, I don't think so. No, so he wasn't a real athlete. He's a, he's a bodybuilder, right? He's he a bodybuilder. He's been bodybuilding since he was like 11 years old. Hmm. Um, so what's the payoff? Okay, so here's the other. But it if, is weird that you kept seeing him on those kinds of channels like the Discovery Channel that aren't really. Oh, I know. So here, here's the other scene. Right, so check this out. He's walking past. I mean, this is like right out of, you know, some some kind of you know Russian or communistic version level of programming. You've got a guy in a wheelchair here who's disabled. You've got these two women. You have you know the duality, the black and white, and they're signing one another. And this is one of the scenes in his public service announcement. And of course, you've got sort of the, the you have someone in a wheelchair. Yeah, you have an so, Asian with blonde hair. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and I another gay flag across the street. Right, right. I, so what we're looking at here is we're looking at a level of programming. Mm -hmm. This is what John, <laughs> this is what we're doing, and it, and it's and they run this over and over again, like it's on a loop on the Discovery Channel, FS1, all these kinds of masculine macho sport. They're running this over mm. and over and over again. Right? Yeah. Now, so John Cena happens to be popular on a certain daytime talk show. And this is his payoff. Right here. So there he is. Oh, boy. All right. So there's his handler. He's, so he's a frequent guest on Ellen. Look, okay. And they're almost kind of mirroring each other. It's kind of weird, you know. I mean... Well, I mean, a lot of Ellen is a very weird role in Hollywood. Um, but he's a, not, he's, a, he's a regular guest. So you and I were talking. Oh, he's about, a regular guest? I've never well, heard. Of, well, well, he's not on there every week, but he's right. on there fairly frequently. Couple, every couple of months or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so you and I were talking about They Live. Right. And if, if people haven't seen They Live, it's a really, it's a really low budget movie. Uh, John Carpenter, and it stars another wrestler by the name of Rowdy Roddy Piper. And in the movie, you wear, he finds these sunglasses where he can see basically how corrupt and venal society has become, that everything is marketing, programming, or advertising. And behind 
all of it is an alien race who has shapeshifted and become humans. And with these glasses, he can see them. And there are humans who are part of their program and they sell out. They sell out for, for prestige or power. It's like, you know, the hall pass to the matrix. And Cena basically fits the profile. In my estimation, like the payoff is getting a regular seat next to Ellen and being cool, right? And getting Sky Vodka ads. And he may believe in this. He may think it's the greatest thing he could do as an American, as a patriot. But I see him more as somebody who's been deployed to get mm-hmm. behind, you know, theoretically to get behind enemy lines and start to tweak people's perceptions about where, what being an American is or, you know, whatever those things are. And you may agree with him and that's fine. Right. But I think that he's been deployed in this way. He knows it. And, the, and this is one of the payoffs. Well, I find, I mean, my whole thing about this is like, I find all of this stuff annoying, right? Like, I, like, if you're a cool person, I love everyone, right? Like, I, you know, I have, I, I like Muslims, gays, blacks, whites, purple, pink, weirdos, like, right? But what yeah. I don't like is the cultural manipulation around some of this, no matter what it is. I don't like Black Lives Matter. I don't like all the weird, you know, like, you know, stuff that's gone on, you know, in, like the gay community used to be a fun place to hang out, right? Like it used to be fun to go to like, you know, a boy bar once in a while, you know what I mean? It was fun. Like I did that when I lived in Austin with friends and whatever. Now it's like the whole thing is like weird, right? Like that, all that kind of stuff. I don't like any of that. I don't like when there is an agenda or a movement or this trying, there's a difference between like, asking people for tolerance and pushing something on them, right? And in my experience, the best way to like get somebody to change their opinion about somebody, something, right, in a holistic way is to have a one-on-one relationship with them and get to know them and they can realize that the person is just a human being like everybody else, right? Like, but having this weird stuff like forced on us, thrown on us about whatever it is, you know, whether it's the transgender stuff or the Black Lives Matter or the Muslim thing, like, you know, like, I don't like, you know, I'm an anarchist. I don't like, I don't like any of it, you know, like, I, I don't like the idea of borders, but I also don't think that like people should expect other people to pay for them when they get to wherever they're going. Right. So like on a certain level, you know, okay, like I, this, the, we're all live here on earth. I, I should be able to go wherever I want and so should everybody else. But when I go somewhere else, I expect to respect the culture and to pay for myself, right? Or, you know, or, or not go or stay home, right? <laughs> like, right? right? And so, you know, th- this thing that we're like, we're importing people and we're, our, the taxpayers from one country are supporting these people who are, it just doesn't, it, that's not the way, if you really are trying to go for tolerance and acceptance and peace and all of that kind of stuff, this pushing things in everybody's face rather than allowing people to have their own one-on-one organic experiences with somebody who may be vastly different than, than they are, right, is not ultimately going to work. It's just going to make people mad. And I think that's what's happening. Well, I think that's part of what they're doing with John Cena. Like, if you yeah. have eyes to see, you'll see what's going on. And you could be pissed off at it. Like, that's insulting on some level. Mm-hmm. You know, it's insulting that you would try to, you know, get inside of, you know, my head or somebody else's head. I don't see how that would possibly work, right? Like, to me, he doesn't look, like, when I think of a typical guy, like, I think of someone like a little bit more rugged looking like than that. Like, he, he looks like the guy you'd see on the box, you know, on two-for-one drink night at a gay bar. Right. Dancing up there, you know, with, you know, dollar bills in his underwear and stuff, huge and muscular, but, you know, he doesn't right. look like a typical macho American guy to me. So I, I think well, it's- Well, a, they're, try, they're trying to sell They're mocking it. us. They're mocking us. They're mocking and trying to sell it at the same time. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's the same with the Serena and the Madonna and all that kind of stuff, right? Right. So I can't, I can't get out of this subject without asking you if, if you've seen the latest Gillette commercial. No, but I heard there's like some hoax transgender- Ho- Gillette commercial or something? It's not just a hoax one. There's a real Gillette oh. transgender commercial. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And what and happened? What's with that? Well, it's it's a it's a woman becoming transitioning to a man, and the father is showing her how to shave. So this is the latest in Gillette's contribution, cutting edge contribution to our culture. And oh, and oh, by the way, and oh, by the way, um, she, he happens to be black. 
Okay. Right? So they're going straight into the heart of the black community with this. And the reason why is because uh, as, as a whole, as a culture as a whole, the black community rejects homosexuality. They're like not into it. Mm-hmm. Right? This is one of the things that- well, Certainly at least not openly, yeah. Not openly, right, from, from that perspective. Um, this is one of the things that, that, you know, Pete Buttigieg or whatever his name is, his handlers are having to face down the fact that Latino culture and black culture mm-hmm. generally rejects. <laughs> Did you see Mr. Reagan's video about Pete Buttigieg? <laughs> No, I didn't. I didn't. Is it funny? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say it. Go check it out when he, because he does like a, he's doing like a breakdown of all the candidates. And when the way he breaks down Buttigieg is <laughs> really funny. We have to watch it. Well, he's like, that name cannot be real. At least it cannot possibly be actually right. pronounced that way. You right. figure out what the pronunciation actually is. <laughs> so so the, his last name basically means manager of chickens. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And well, Trump, I don't think that's what Mr. Reagan was saying. He was going more of what it sounded like. Right, right. right? With, with the butt gig. <laughs> yeah. The butt gig, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Totally. I mean, that's how, that's, 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 this is all how either the simulation is making itself so obviously obvious or how obviously everyone is being mocked, right? Like. Well, I think that, I think, yes, people are being mocked. It's obvious. And somehow they think that, uh, providing um, cover in a very obvious way will somehow assuage minority groups' views of an openly homosexual president, right? I think that that's, that's part of what's going on. And these people, I think, are arrogant. I think they're arrogant to think that that's actually going to work or that's actually going to you know, mean something to a voting block. I don't think yeah. that. Now, so I find this, I have to say, I find this just like, you know, this is offensive. And I, but I also found it offensive, like in the eighties when like, you know, the, all the satanic panic stuff was going on and the, all this like really ev- ev- evangelical Christian stuff was being, you know, talked about all the time and shoved down people's throats. And that was what people were running on where I'm a, I'm a good, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's offensive. It's like, it's like if you have no other qualities to talk about, like those are not, these are like either preferences or um, immutable characteristics, right? Like one or the other. These are not really anything about like things you've worked hard for, things you've achieved, like what your character really is. And it's offensive to me that they keep selling us on things, trying to sell us on things that don't actually matter at all. If the person is, I, I'm not interested in having any presidents, but let's say I was a person who wanted a president, I wouldn't care at all, like, you know, who he went home to at night or, you know, what the color of his skin was or whatever. It's like, do you do what you say you're going to do? And are you, you know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff, right? And, and this is all such a distraction from any of that. Right. Well, I, I would tend to agree with you. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, it seems like everybody's kind of a cardboard cutout who kind of everybody falls into party lines. Mm-hmm. You know, Pete Buttigieg would be much more interesting if he was on the right. Yeah. He'd be much more interesting. Yep. You know, I mean, uh, and I think the, it, would, it would just be a total mind fog yeah. in a lot of ways. But because of who he is and his platforms, which are basically the same as Beto O'Rourke's. Right. Same. Well, they, they, made, they made about six or eight of these candidates that all had the same platform, but were an appeal to slightly different groups of identity politics people. Right. Which right. one would stick, right? Like, yeah. Right. So it's, it's, it's almost as if, you know, for all of your Midwestern hominess and Mayor Pete shit, and you're serving in the army, and all the things that somehow theoretically set you apart, he's just like anybody else. Or he's just like anybody else on that side. It would have been, yeah. much, more, would have been much more interesting if he would have said, you know what, I'm on the right. And these yeah. are the things that I believe in. These are my precepts. You know, less government is a better government, blah, blah, blah. But he's, but he's not. Yeah. He's not. Like if he were like sort of like a libertarian-ish or something like that, right? Yeah. yeah. If, if he'd gone down that path and be like, wow, that guy's kind of interesting. Yeah. Ultimately, once you get past the window dressing on him, he's a cliche. Yeah. 
Yeah, they, I mean, they all, all I mean, they're, they're all ridiculous. Did you see this? Uh, do you ever watch the Jimmy Dore show? Yeah, he's funny. Did you see the shit he did about um, Elizabeth Warren promoting eco-friendly, kill, eco-friendly killing, right? Because she was talking about how important it is to make our military bases green-friendly, right? <laughs> he's talking about you send a missile as long as you send it with a leaf on, green leaf on it. And so, you know, like, but the, the, the shtick he did on it was so funny, right? But right. there's like, it's all, I mean, these are not even good con jobs anymore. They're, no, they're, they're really bad. They're terrible. They're terrible. These are Nigerian, you know, internet scams. They totally are. And you know what's, yeah. really, what's really insulting here? What's really insulting is the fact that you and I and 99.9% of the people watching this video know for a fact that below top secret, right, or, or, or rather above top secret, right? That they've got technology that'll, that'll blow our fucking minds. Right. And they're just holding back on this technology. Like if they wanted to, they could roll stuff out and we could get 35, 40 years ahead in tomorrow, less than a decade. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. And, and we're just, again, circling the drain on this stuff. Right. Well, all, you know? all, literally, if they just, Stop the bullshit with the covering up of the, you know, uh, free energy technology, cold fusion or, exactly. or Leonard or whatever, like that halfway fixes every problem we have. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's more than that too, right? There's right. A, they've got attendant technologies that are related to that. And so what we're, what we're seeing now is we're just. Oh, they have frequency technologies that can heal any disease. All they have to do is like zap you with the frequency for an hour and exactly. cure your cancer and shit. Exactly. Yeah. But, they, but they'd rather, you know, build people. This dumb shit. Yeah. Right. So, so that part is, and people tend to lose sight of that. And I, and I know for a minute that people like, you know, Jordan Sather and some of the other SSP right. people were talking about this. We'll talk, talk. But, and that part of it is something I think. But they always tie it to aliens. Right. They never tie it to the fools at MIT who simultaneously say there is no cold fusion. Meanwhile, you can find a video online of a cold fusion device in the MIT laboratory. Right. Exactly. They don't ever talk about that. They just talk about how the aliens are going to bring it to us. Right. So it's there. It's yeah. existing. It's existed for years. Okay. And this is, this is, you know, now we're in this turf war between Trump and the Democrats and just all this bullshit. And, and, you know, and then these, we, these bizarre kind of neocon foreign entanglements right. that are just so old school and prehistoric. That are now like super liberal, right? The liberals love them. Oh, liberals yeah. love war now, right? Like yeah. the way that the left is smearing Tulsi Gabbard is just like. <laughs> well, they can't have somebody come in and actually be a real, real person. No. Because yeah. they, they've already got the title and the deed to surreal estate, right? Yeah, it's a real estate. <laughs> yeah. And she's a real person. Yeah. She talks to people in a real way. She, could, and she has, you know, real ideas. So, yeah. She also the, looks like she could fuck you up, too. Tulsi Gabbard? Yeah, she looks like she might. She, she, she doesn't look like someone you'd want to mess with. Yeah, I think she's got a bit of an edge to her, for sure. Yeah. She's got four planets in Aries, so she's got, yeah. a, lot of, she's got a lot of firepower. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I would agree with that. But but you know the whole thing is just ultimately really insulting because we're we're not getting to the heart of the matter. The heart no. of the matter is is that they're sitting on really mind blowing technology. And there's- I remember when you had that guy on who talked about he had a political party that was just going to be the free energy party, and the whole platform was going to be that you know everybody would get a free energy device. And that was, that was it. He would make sure that happened, and then he'd resign and move on, right Dave. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Dave. Yeah. I remember that show. Yeah. Yeah. He's still around. He's still on Facebook. Dave Parker. He's a nice yeah. guy. Yeah. He lives, he lives in Texas. Um, but I mean, that's actually what pe- people should forget about all of these parties. Like right now, they just made a whole party in England about Brexit and they won. Right. Yeah. They, they have no other platform other than Brexit. I think that's probably if you're going to if you insist on playing in politics, that's the way to go is to just have one topic parties where the whole point is get this person elected to make this happen. And then that's over. Right. Like that free energy party, you know, stop the, the GMO party, stop, you know, whatever, stop the 5G party, you know, or whatever the fuck it is. But stop having it, people like pick one cause and just hammer away at that as a party. How about the pussy party? <laughs> Jasper for president. 
<laughs> so uh, yeah, I agree with you. You know, I told yeah. you. I mean, that's originally that's how corporations were supposed to work. Corporations came out of the New Deal, right? And, and corporations were supposed to be a limited partnership between a private entity and a public entity. Public entity. Mm -hmm the government which would grant the cor corporation status right mm -hmm. and so so the government created these things so that they could fast track um the new deal and the building of the infrastructure in the united states right it was fascism it was fascism well but they said this is really, <laughs> this is a really good deal you know, let's keep this corporate thing going right but that's okay. what, that i mean that's what fascism. how they were yeah that's how they started yeah and now they well and now the governments are corporations that's right exactly yeah. 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 Um, so we've been going for like about an hour and a half. Yeah, I know. And we've only started to scratch. <laughs> Just like Jasper is only starting to get scratched right now. We didn't, we, we, I mean, we've talked about some interesting stuff, but we had some other things we wanted to talk about. Are you, you think we should keep going or do you want to stop it here and we'll pick well, up? Why don't, we, why don't we stop it here? Let's give yeah. people a teaser. Okay. Yeah. So, um, we do what I, you, you had something you wanted to say about the new Quentin Tarantino film. And I did watch a little video about uh, him getting hassled by a ridiculous reporter the other day, but I don't really know much else about the film. So I'll, that'll give me time to kind of, you know, look into that. But, you know, I, you did some really interesting stuff where you found this guy who looked like Jordan Peterson from a while back. What was his name again? He had some numbers for his, his name. All right. So if you're going to get into, we should just get into it then. Oh, you just said give a teaser. So I was giving a teaser. Oh, man. Okay. I mean, this will be a whole other hour. If that, was, that was too much of a tease for me. Oh. It, was like, it was really, oh, let's go there. Oh. All right, let, let me just, let me just. Um, give a tease. Let me just show people real quickly. All right, Jasper, you, you, you're great. But you're gonna... Jasper's like, but what about me? What about me? Okay, so, Jasper, my kitty knows that she she's yeah, well. She comes over once in a while during the show, but I don't know where she is. Go play with Olivia, Jasper. Go find my kitty and play. All right. So um, this will be the tease for people. All right. So here mm -hmm. we have Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. and then over here in this uh, window is a fellow by the name of uh, Brother 12. Mm -hmm. And Brother 12 um, was this dude, his last name was Wilson. And uh, he was born in the uh, 1800s, I think around 1876, right around there. Mm -hmm. And um, or, or I think it was, well, when we get into things around 1876. Anyway, um, he became the leader of a cult called the Aquarian Society, mm -hmm. right? That was that was uh, that was his cult. And um, here, let me just let me just punch up his bio really quickly. I just want to make sure that we get all the details in. Okay. So he was born in 1878. So I was right on that part. And his full name was Edward Arthur Wilson. And his community uh, was creating this group called the Aquarian. It was based on the Theosophical Society. Basically, mm -hmm. basically the, it's called the Aquarian Foundation. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he founded it in 1827 on Nanaimo, which is an island uh, off the coast of British Columbia, and then he went even further. Whoa, that's weird. Okay, yeah, into, go ahead. Into, into that island chain and found another island that was smaller where he um, started this kind of agrarian community. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was basically a doomsday cult because he knew that something absolutely uh, devastating was going to happen to the world and the economy. And he was actually right mm -hmm. because the great depression is about to happen. And he's like intuiting the great depression getting ready to take place. Mm -hmm. So he, when he was in his forties, around 43, he was in the South of France and he was ailing and he, he was in a hospital bed in the South of France and he had his image of this onk floating before him. 
and he um, got this message that he was the reincarnation of Akhenaten and that he was the 12th member of this spiritual group that was going to essentially be like the great white brotherhood and run the planet. That's according okay. to him. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he eventually goes from the south of France. I don't know how he gets to Vancouver, but he starts to write and he starts to preach this Aquarian gospel. All these people are drawn to him and they donate lots of money because they had a very serious community. They're growing food. Oh, kind of like he will donate lots of money to Jordan Peterson. <laughs> well, that's part of the story. They're, right. they're both very... Jordan Peterson, I mean, Material, he, materialistic. Let's put Jordan it Peterson, before he left Patreon, was making $75,000 a month on Patreon. So he finally left Patreon? He, he and Dave Rubin both left as a protest over the Sargon of Akkad thing. So yeah. I don't know. They're both using PayPal and I think maybe some subscribe store or other things. They're apparently, we're supposed to build a platform. We haven't heard really you know, much about it, a free speech kind of Patreon platform or something. But this is very interesting. When I saw you talking about this, I, you know, and I'm just going to tease a little bit, but I have been mulling over for several years, but it just sort of came to a new level of clarity for me. Um, what secret societies really are about what past lives, reincarnation, future selves, all this stuff, what this stuff really is. And when I saw you talking about this, I'm like, this is an opportunity for us to talk about this, see if we can tie some of this stuff together. So you guys stay tuned for the next Matrix Mash. We're going to get into, you know, what, what cults, what secret societies are, and can you, can you choose your reincarnation? Right. And... I, I basically, I didn't, well, I kind of stumbled upon it, but I, I did their charts. Yeah. And I, I think there's a very clear case to be made that, that he is the reincarnation of Brother 12. All right. So, guys, hang on to that. And uh, we're going to get into that, uh, you know, uh, on our next Matrix Mass, which will be maybe a week and a half or something like that. I have some things to take care of this week, but... I always really love doing these with you, uh, Robert, that I love to just kind of, you know, whip through all the different topics. And uh, we kind of had started to, to this morning, we had plans to talk about different stuff than we did, but it all kind of always works out and is very cool. And I really enjoy it. So I'm really looking forward to that next one. And me too. Um, yeah, me too. And, and, and I'm sure something else will come up to talk about by then too. <laughs> yeah. And, and I just want to, you know, let people know that, you know, it's okay to be a white cat. <laughs> It really is. <laughs> I saw you did a show that was called that, and I started watching it, but I don't think I ever got to the resolution of the point with the white cat. So, but that is a terrifying looking cat. So it's okay to be a white cat. <laughs> <laughs> it's also okay to be an obnoxious, you know, person that talks too much and has a and, and sort of terrifying laugh. So, you know, <laughs> all things are okay in this world, right? As long well, as, as they're not forced. As, 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 as Crowley once said, everything is permitted. Ah, Sonia says it too. She's like, there are no laws. Everything is allowed, (laughs) right? I love Sonia. Anyway, all right, guys. So this is going to wrap it up for this Matrix Mash, which I don't even remember which number it is, but I'll figure it out. I think it's Um, 10, 10. It's 10? All right. 10 is in brother 10. 10, okay. So maybe we'll just skip 11 and do 12. I don't know. (laughs) So you guys can find Robert at robertphoenix.com. Get a reading. Check out 15 Minutes of Flame and Friday Farcast and what, the Sunday night astrology show. He's doing awesome stuff over there. You guys can hit me up at off planet media or, or sorry, YouTube channel, off planet media, patreon.com forward slash off planet media. Or you can uh, connect with me on Facebook at Emily Moyer. If you would like an intuitive esoteric nutrition consultation, let's get to it. We'll see you next time. Have a good one guys. All right. Peace. Stop. Yeah.